Alchemy is offering uh, a new way to kind of give theater to people who need it and who want it, uh, especially right now where we can't be in the same community, the same room with each other. Uh, and, you know, Zoom and Facebook Live and all of those different uh, streaming mediums have been really, really good about that. Uh, it's, it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. You know, as an actor, you want to be able to communicate with not only the audience, but also the people you're acting with. And it, it presents new challenges. Like, for example, you, you don't get to really look at the person you're acting with. You're kind of looking at the lens of your camera so you can connect with the audience, but you don't get that same connection. Um, so there, there are challenges there, but it also lets us really bring it to a wider audience and do things uh, with a smaller budget that we would be able to do on, you know, in a normal space. You know, certain shows that require huge spectacle and lots of sets and lots of costumes well, obviously, if you're watching it on Zoom, you know, you're not going to go in expecting that. So it kind of frees up the theater companies to really expand and get creative on how they present these shows. Absolutely. And with, um, you know, with the fact that we, uh, in the midst of this pandemic, are trying to figure out what the future of theater looks like and what um, is possible <laughs> when we aren't able to gather, when we aren't able to, even necessarily as um, as actors or folks who are in the rehearsal rooms, you know, there's no way to do a love scene socially distant uh, when you're in the space, you know? So it's been very interesting and very cool to kind of explore what will still tell the story, what will still get our point across, what will still connect with audiences um, when we aren't able to uh, be in the room with them, connecting to them, um, which is part of what makes live theater so magical and so gorgeous and, and what we all love so much about it. Um, but I think that uh, with streaming it, you're still getting to see it in real time. You're still getting the feeling of being present um, because it is live. It's just not uh, in the room with you. So um, it's been a very certainly interesting challenge. And uh, we are working with, um, we've got a costume designer lovely Hannah Anderson, um, who is working with us on this project to um, bring some elements of what a live production would be and would look like, um, even within the confines of uh, being distant from one another. Tell me, why did Alchemy choose this play? Why did, you, why did Alchemy want to do this play? Uh, well, I will, I will take the blame on that one. Uh, Alchemy, <laughs> Alchemy decided to do this play because I asked. No, um, but kind of true. So in the midst of everything kind of going on right now in the world and all the, the protests and for, you know, the pandemic and everything happening, um, you know, me personally, I was having a really, really rough day, like a really, really hard day dealing with it. And it just, you know, you have your peaks and your valleys and I was in a valley. Um, and it's funny, Jay and I have talked about this many times. Uh, for some reason, whenever you need angels in America, it just happens to appear to you. Um, and it's for good or bad. I mean, there have been times where I really, <laughs> I really needed it and I really wanted it. There it was. And there have been times where it comes and smacks me across the face. And it reminds me of, of certain things. But I, I needed it in that moment. There's a, a particular monologue that a character Belize gives in the second part, Perestroika, towards like the middle of the end of the show that spoke to me in that moment and spoke to exactly what I was feeling. And it was like, it was like, uh, like a bubble head burst, like an emotional bubble head burst hearing those words. It was very soothing and very comforting to hear the emotions I couldn't put words to, put to words by someone else. Um, and I kind of took a moment and, you know, had my moment and cried it out. And then uh, immediately messaged uh, Jeff Lowe, you know, uh, artistic director for Alchemy, who is a good friend of mine. I'm like, hey, just a thought. Um, I think it'd be a really, really good idea for Alchemy to do a Zoom production of Angels in America for Pride Month. Uh, a, it's a, you know, a very, very prolific queer piece of theater. Um, and it definitely 
shows a vast um, expression of the queer experience, especially in late 80s, early 90s, dealing with AIDS and dealing with all, all the stuff the show deals with. Um, and it's not, it's not a fluff piece. It's not a simple piece, but it's, it's something that I think we need right now. And I think the, the words are things that people need to hear right now, either to bolster their resolve while they keep fighting for what they're fighting for, or to remind them why we're fighting, or to show people who may not understand why people are fighting, why they're fighting. Um, and so that's kind of my reason for wanting to bring it forward, is to kind of bring those words forward and, and hopefully inspire people the way they inspired me when I needed them. I feel very much the same about it. Um, uh, Angels in America is a, it's all in the second part of the title, a gay fantasia on national themes. And uh, I think that because it is so grand and the story is so, uh, it's an epic, you know, it's a fantasy. Um, so in making so many aspects of it so grand, I think it gives us an even clearer connection to, uh, to what it's talking about, uh, the things that are being addressed within this show. Um, but also it is, Aside from when it was written, I don't know that it's ever been more timely. Um, and there are so many direct parallels to uh, what we are experiencing as a country, as a culture um, right now. And there are, like Joey said, it is, um, it has been a great comfort to me uh, in this very difficult, difficult, painful time of growth and change that we are experiencing right now. Um, it's been a great comfort to me to have words that are so eloquently put and so, um, and get right into the heart of, and the guts of what we're all talking about in this moment. Um, and the need for change and the need for forward motion. Um, and nobody quite says it like Tony Kushner in that way um, when we're talking about specifically the, um, the nationalism and the, uh, the American-ness of a lot of what we're experiencing right now. Angels in America follows the story of a gay man in New York City um, in 1985, beginning in 1985, um, who is diagnosed with AIDS um, and is visited by an angel with a mandate to uh, help stop the progression of the human race uh, moving forward. Uh, and it follows all of the people in his life who are on either parallel journeys or uh, sometimes journeys in the opposite direction. Uh, and we meet a plethora of uh, queer men who are uh, all experiencing this uh, plague at the same time. Uh, some of whom are positive, some of whom are not. Uh, and it really explores the human condition when we are put under enormous strain. Uh, it explores what it is to be American. It explores what it is to... be a person uh, and especially uh, what unique challenges we all face when, uh, when we happen to be people who maybe aren't uh, considered 
when it comes to the zeitgeist, the monolith, the uh, power in the country and uh, in the communities. Uh, well, let's start with Lewis. Why oh don't God. we start with Lewis? Cute. So Lewis, uh, Lewis is a gay man living in New York City. Uh, he is the lover of Pryor, the, the main protagonist of the show that Jay was talking about. And uh, Lewis, Lewis's journey is all about understanding the, the trials and tribulations that come with being someone who is wants so badly to be a part of America and want so badly to be a part of the queer community um, and, and trying to find a way to reconcile his beliefs in what America should be with what America is and well, how America treats the queer community. Uh, and he, he goes on a journey. He goes up and down and left and right and sideways, wanders 40 years in the desert um, and eventually comes to uh, a conclusion that's I'm not going to tell you the conclusion, but it's, uh, there is a, I can't think of the word. I completely lost my entire train of thought. That's real cute. That's very Lewis. I know. It's like a typecast. <laughs> um, it's ugly and real. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he, he deals a lot with trying to understand how to, how to deal with um, the fact that the community is dying and whether he wants to kind of continue to be a part of that and it, it scares him. It scares him to death almost uh, and it's it takes a lot for him to kind of come around um, but you know eventually he does and you know some hopefully without hurting too many people on the way. Uh, I hope that was vague yet specific enough. <laughs> Um, we have, I'm going to go ahead and just take this on down. Hey, we love a good reveal. <laughs> um, so we have an incredibly for, <laughs> for the fact that, uh, these characters, uh, with a few exception were written uh, from the perspective of the white queer male experience, um, they, within that confine, they are a very diverse group of people. Um, they're one of our, we have a character who is uh, Mormon and uh, in the closet and struggling to come out and leave his wife. Um, we have his wife who is a an incredibly complex and uh, heart-centered character. Uh, we have uh, the Mormon man's mother who goes on a journey of learning to accept or not. Um, we have Pryor who is an ex-drag queen. We have his best Judy Belize who is uh, also an ex-drag queen and a nurse who works on the AIDS ward and a black queer man uh, in 1985. Uh, we have Lewis who is uh, Jewish and who is uh, directly dealing with the consequences and the really hard and human parts of uh, the AIDS epidemic at the time while not being positive himself. Uh, and then we have Roy Cohn, who is a fictionalized version of an actual man uh, who was, who got his start in politics under Joe McCarthy um, and who carried that gorgeous, lovely uh, flavor with him through until his death uh, in the 80s. So we really explore what it is to be a part of 
the queer community, especially as it is, uh, for lack of a better word, under phrase, under attack. Um, not only were we experiencing the actual physical dangers of the AIDS epidemic and all that that entails, but uh, we, the threat of violent homophobia is still to this day very alive um, and well. And uh, the, and on top of that, at that time we had a president who would not say the word AIDS and denied that it was any sort of problem that needed to be handled. So again, the perspectives are very, uh, are varied uh, and the circumstances are eerily similar to some of the things that we're experiencing today. Well, the play, well, it deals with all of the issues, like on this, not on the surface, but uh, at, at face value, it deals with all the issues of, you know, queer people during the AIDS epidemic in the 80s and everything that entails. The, the base of the play really talks about change and what it means to change and what it means to move forward as a country. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk in the play about forward motion. And there's, again, another monologue in the second part where someone talks about change and it's not a nice monologue. Change is hard, change is ugly, change hurts. And it's, you have to, you have to be the one to change yourself. Um, and it's, it's very poignant and very, very kind of stark in a way. Um, and I feel like that's where we are kind of as at a country right now. We're in a place where change is happening and it's hard and people are resisting change because it's hard and we have to change we have to keep moving forward we can't move backwards time doesn't work that way the world doesn't spin that way um and i think this is a great reminder of that and a great way to show people how to do that and it it really puts to words a way to help deal with that in, in both the positive and negative. I mean, change is good, change is great, but it's hard and this is how you do it. It's kind of the sugar to take your medicine, but the sugar is also kind of sour itself. Um, but it's, it's so important. And um, yeah, I think it's, that's the message that I think the audience really needs to hear. As, you know, aside from all of the obvious, you know, social things that it brings up and those things are very, very important. Uh, but I think the thing to highlight right now really is the the need for change and the the way to change. Yes, agreed. Um, as we've kind of touched on, the show offers a sort of blueprint in a way if you if you want to use it that way. There is a As we discuss the value of and the deep necessity for change, um, there are so many moments in this show where uh, it's very easy to connect with the characters as they're grappling with that and as they're struggling with it. Um, and for me personally, there's a lot of characters and moments in the show where I have felt very similar despair and pain uh, that they are talking about. And to see them triumph and to see them take that pain and transform it into not only something useful for themselves and not only a way to um, ease the pain within themselves, but to use that pain as a catalyst to continue to move forward despite it. Um, and sometimes, uh, sometimes because of it, um, 
but it sort of centers around a, a hopefulness that it doesn't matter how painful, how dark, how frightening the world is or your circumstances are, to continue to live anyway in the face of that is the bravest and most valuable thing that we can do as human beings. And to reach back and pull forward the people behind us is all that is noble and good in the world. Uh, well, Alchemy Theater is really unique uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, one that I can think of off the top of my head is that it's actually run by a surprisingly young group of performers. Um, it's people who aren't um, necessarily fully established and ingrained in what's the current Orange County theater community as, as uh, a, a uh, I can't think of the word, a production team. That's the word. I'm doing really good at this, guys. You're killing uh, it. Thanks. Love it. Um, and I think that gives them a really unique perspective. Uh, and it gives them a chance to take risks that I think that some, some other companies may, may not want to or may not be able to. Um, and that's inspiring as an actor. You want to go to a company that's going to take risks, that's going to let you suggest a show and then let you produce it um, out of nowhere uh, over a basic message. Um, and give you the support and not just say, okay, go have fun. If it fails, it fails. Like I've felt so supported by the entire team uh, from day one. And they're really just the sweetest people you'll ever meet and so passionate about theater and so passionate about making theater better, uh, not just for Orange County, but theater in general and bringing it to people any way they can. I mean, doing it over Zoom is a challenge and they've jumped in, you know, head first and really kind of paved the way. Like I, Alki is one of the first people I saw doing this. Now I'm seeing theater companies all over the place doing full productions like this. And I think that's, that's really inventive and really inspiring and something that makes actors want to get involved. And not just actors, but also other creatives behind the scenes, technicians and, and crew and, and stage managers. You want to get involved because they're, they're going to inspire you and they want, they want to inspire you and they want you to inspire them. That is exactly. Uh, alchemy is a very special place in terms of creating. Um, I, there have been very few spaces um, that I've been in that uh, really, everyone is so deeply passionate about the power of theater. Um, and I, it's been a wonderful experience to uh, get to do a dream show that because it is a show that does have a lot of uh, spectacle that especially a smaller company may have a harder time producing it. And uh, within this format, especially Alchemy went, okay, do it, just do it. And they do that with all of their shows. They, are really invested in supporting their creative teams, uh, their designers, their directors, their producers um, that are not necessarily uh, like regular company members. Uh, they are, or like founding company members. Uh, and they are so supportive of their actors. They are very, there's always a, um, I don't know, there's a, a lot of respect and there's a lot of confidence in people and there is a lot of um, just support, gen genuine cheerleading that happens. Um, and that is, so uh, incredibly important 